ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Maxion Solar Technology Third Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. Currently, all participants are on the snowy mode. Later, we'll conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. I would now turn the conference over to your host, Mr. Gary DeVortex of the Blue Shirt Group. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, operator. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Maxion's third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. With us today is Chief Executive Officer Jeff Waters and Chief Financial Officer Joanne Solomon. Also available for questions during the Q&A is Chief Strategy Officer Peter Aschenbrenner. Let me cover a few housekeeping items before I turn the call over to Jeff. As a reminder, a replay of this call will be available later today on the Investor Relations page of Maxion's website. During today's call, we will make forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties that are described in the safe harbor slide of today's presentation, today's press release, the 6K, and other SEC filings. Please see those documents for additional information regarding those factors that may affect these forward-looking statements. To enhance this call, we have also posted a supplemental slide deck on the events and presentations page of Maxion's Investor Relations website. Finally, we want to point out that results reflect the full three-month period. Through August 26, we were part of SunPower. Since then, we have operated as an independent company. With that, let me turn the call over to Maxion's CEO, Jeff Waters. Jeff? Thank you, Gary, and good day, everyone. I'm delighted to be addressing you today as the CEO of Maxion Solar Technologies in our first earnings call as an independent company. I'd like to start by thanking the teams at Maxion and SunPower as well as our strategic shareholders, TZS and Total. It was the collective hard work and collaboration of these teams that made possible our spinoff on August 26th. We're energized and optimistic as we start this new chapter as a recapitalized independent company with leading technology, brand, and global downstream channel. This first quarter as an independent Maxion was a good one. The recovery in our business continued with solid sequential growth in shipments and revenue and improved margins. Growth was balanced across all geographies, driven primarily by the strong channels we have built in the distributed generation, or DG, segment. Joanne will cover those financial details shortly. Now I'll review developments in our two businesses, DG and large-scale power plant. First, DG, which we expect to continue as the near-term driver of our business. DG was strong around the world, with sequential revenue growth of 35%. Nearly all regions grew sequentially as markets continued to recover from the COVID-induced disruption. We believe that the DG opportunity outside the U.S. is promising. For example, let's look more closely at Europe, which was especially strong this quarter. In Q3, we shipped 106 megawatt into the European DG market, almost equal to the 110 megawatt that went into the U.S. to our partner, SunPower. We expect continued DG growth in Europe due to three primary factors. First, demand in our core markets, such as Italy, Benelux, France, and Germany, continues to grow, driven by the increasingly attractive economics of self-consumption and strong government support measures. Second, we continue to build market share, having nearly doubled our share of the European DG market in the past two years. Finally, we're expanding our footprint into incremental markets, such as Greece, Hungary, Cyprus, Bulgaria, and Lithuania. To further accelerate growth, in October, we initiated an incentive program for installers that buy through our official distributors. This program is intended to strengthen our distribution network by giving installers the tools to both create and rapidly fulfill demand. We introduced the program in five European countries and expect to roll it out across Europe in 2021. In parallel to expanding our geographic footprint, we are driving product innovation. In July, we made the first concrete step toward implementing our Beyond the Panel strategy when we in announced our AC module product line. We are already taking orders in certain European markets and expect to make our first AC module shipments within the next few weeks. Our inverter integrated AC panels offer several compelling benefits. Installers benefit with access to highly differentiated best-in-class products and a simplified sales, design, and installation process. The factory integrated and tested panel enables sewer parts and installation steps, and a single SKU simplifies inventory management. 
As well, installers can capture more revenue because the system is easily expanded with incremental panels. In the end, installers and customers get more peace of mind from a high-performance, reliable product that will produce more energy over the life of the system. On top of the increased reliability and performance, end customers also benefit from an industry-leading 25-year product warranty. And with a monitoring app that displays real-time and historical performance data, customers can confidently monitor performance, system performance and health anytime, anywhere. We expect sales of AC modules to ramp throughout 2021 as we expand into other geographies and as we incorporate microinverters into our performance product line. Now I'll turn to our large-scale business. This business is driven by our performance series panels, which deliver differentiated value through our patented shingling technology, selling it to power plant and other large-scale opportunities. We expect this end market to drive growth for us over time, with the business showing solid growth in the third quarter and with revenue up 7% sequentially. As we look out over the coming year, there are two factors that we expect to moderate near-term revenue growth in our large-scale business. The first factor is strong projected demand within China at higher ASPs than are available in most other global markets. Second, the China upstream supply chain is experiencing a series of disruptions in terms of limited availability and price increases for key materials such as polysilicon and glass. Global logistics costs have also increased, mainly due to COVID-related factors. All this is pressuring the near-term price competitiveness of our P-series uh, products outside of China. For these reasons, we've agreed with our HSPV joint venture to significantly shift volume allocation to the Chinese market through mid-2021. As a reminder, performance series sales to China are made by HSPV, not Maxion. That said, we're confident that shifting volume to China is clearly the right call for HSPV and for Maxion as a joint venture partner, since the profit from sales in China will allow HSPV to improve its financial performance and to drive scale and cost down more rapidly. This ability to flex our volume allocation enables Maxion to have a capital efficient approach to the large scale market. Partnering with TZS to create the HSPV joint venture enabled Maxion to avoid a high fixed cost base while serving the large scale market. The ramp of HSPV's first new three gigawatt smart fab continues with full operation expected by the end of the quarter. Demand is high in China for the new bifacial P5 panels, and we're working hard with HSPV on further shingled cell technology innovations to drive continued performance increases and cost reductions. From Axion, we therefore expect recovery in our large-scale shipment volume to happen later in 2021. We believe that the upstream supply chain should return to a more balanced situation over the next few quarters. We also expect logistics costs, which have been impacted by COVID, to decrease over that period as additional shipping capacity is released. As supply chain costs normalize and as HSPV drives scale through sales in China and implements further technology improvements, we expect Maxion's large-scale business to return to growth mode and be an important contributor to overall company profitability. Let me now touch on progress with our IBC technology Rootfresh and Fab3. We plan to install the first MAX-6 line by Q4 2021 and plan to have converted the existing MAX-5 line to MAX-6 by, by early 2022. Our IBC technology continues to lead the industry in terms of performance and, as you'll hear shortly from Joanne, commands premium ASPs. Replacement of our 10-year-old MAX-2 technology with new leading-edge MAX-6 capacity is expected to further increase our differentiation versus the competition and to support gross margin expansion. To summarize, Maxion is now positioned to grow as an independent recapitalized company. We're focused on building our DG business around the world, further enhancing the value of our panels by incorporating AC functionality and expanding our industry leading DG channel footprint into new markets. We are proceeding with our Fab3 technology refresh that will upgrade our entire IBC manufacturing fleet to the highest levels of industry, industry performance leadership and premium value. Meanwhile, we're being patient and disciplined in pursuing the large-scale opportunity, which we expect to be sizable over time. Now I will turn the call over to Joanne to review our financial performance. Joanne? Thank you, Jeff, and hello, everyone. 
I will discuss the drivers and details of our third quarter performance and provide some forward-looking information. Overall, revenue grew 25% sequentially, driven by particularly strong demand recovery in our DG business, where revenue was up 35% sequentially and comprised 71% of our total revenue. Quarter-on-quarter -quarter revenue growth in our large-scale business was a solid 7%. Geographic revenue mix for Q3 was well balanced, with approximately 30% from the Asia-Pacific region, 40% from Europe and the Middle East, and 30% from the Americas. We saw significant sequential revenue growth in North America, offset by a decline in revenue in South America due to the completion of a power plant project in Q2. IBC product revenue increased from 59% to 67% of total revenue, driven by strong DG market demand and recovery from COVID. Performance series revenue was essentially in line with the prior quarter as growth in the DG market was offset by timing of shipments for a power plant project. About 70% of both IBC and performance series shipments went into our DG business. Revenue per watt in our IBC product line was stable versus the previous quarter at just over 50 cents. Performance series revenue per watt decreased by 9% to 26 cents on the completion of two higher priced legacy contracts. Q3 revenues were down 33% compared with the previous year. With our DG business down due to COVID disruptions and customers tightly managing inventory. The large-scale business was down due to the completion of contracts in Asia and South America. With respect to IBC manufacturing, our latest MAX-5 line has ramped nicely in Malaysia and is now at a run rate of around 240 megawatts per year. This has enabled us to double MAX-5 shipments sequentially. With the planned MAX-6 expansion, we expect to end 2021 with a little over one gigawatt of total IBC capacity split evenly between our fabs in Malaysia and the Philippines. Moving down the P&L, our gross profit was a loss of $12 million for Q3, or 6% of revenue. As a reminder, we have a long-term supply contract for polysilicon at prices significantly above prevailing market rates. Our Q3 results include losses of $40 million attributable to that contract. Without those losses, gross profit would have been $28 million, or 13%. This demonstrates an otherwise meaningful improvement sequentially and reflects the strength of our DG business. Next, OPEX. Operating expenses increased to $27 million with the reversal of a few temporary COVID cost reduction efforts. For Q4, we expect operating expenses of around $33 million, due in part to incremental costs related to the separation from SunPower. Our Q3 EBITDA, adjusted solely for stock-based compensation, was a loss of $39 million. As described in our earnings release, N6K, three items adversely impacted our adjusted EBITDA. First, the $40 million of losses associated with the above-market polysilicon contract. Second, a $6 million accommodation fee associated with amending that contract. And third, $6 million of remeasurement losses on the borrowing facilities associated with our green convertible notes. Now, let us turn to liquidity and capital investment. We ended the quarter with $310 million of cash. We expect our year-end cash balance will be around $200 million after making payments under the long-term polysilicon contract, the final installment of $30 million to AUO related to acquisition of their legacy interest in our Malaysia factory, and 20 to $35 million of planned capital investment. Total capital investment planned for 2020 is $35 million to $50 million down from prior expectations, largely due to timing of those investments. Most of that capital investment will be for MAX-6 manufacturing lines and R&D. For 2021, we're planning capital investments between $75 million and $150 million, depending on demand trends, resurgence in COVID, for delays in ramping our large-scale business and performance series offering. Finally, let's turn to our Q4 outlook. For Q4, we are expecting mid-teens sequential increases in shipments by megawatts and revenue. 
The shipment guidance reflects strong demand in the DGN market, especially in Europe and the U.S. As mentioned earlier, our performance series gross margin will be under pressure from price increases for key materials such as polysilicon, glass, and logistics costs. The adjusted EBITDA guidance reflects those gross margin headwinds and higher OPEX. With that, we'll move to the Q&A session. Operator, please proceed. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star than one on your touchtone telephone. Our first question comes from Brian Lee of Goldman Sachs. The line is open. Hey, everyone. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, could you, uh, yeah, and we appreciate uh, all the, the, the disclosures and the breakouts on the mix. That's super helpful. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, what the mix is going to look like here um, for uh, the performance line versus IBC and Q4? And then I know you made some comments about, you know, pushing some of that into China and also maybe um, delaying, it sounds like, the performance line volume. Uh, how should we be thinking about maybe the first half of 21 in terms of mix as well? I'll take, hey, uh, Brian, this is Jeff Waters. I'll take, the, for, I'll take the second part of the question around China, and then I'll go to Joanne to speak more to uh, – the Q4 mix between P and IBC. So first, on the, on the China side, you know, as, we, as we said in the prepared remarks, we are, uh, with the current uh, increases in supply chain costs that we're seeing, uh, we are seeing our offtake for the rest of world business being pretty minimal through the first half of 2021. We are expecting that to improve. Uh, the DG side of the business will still proceed as we would expect, where as you know, the performance series products also go into DG as well as the power plant side. Uh, we are still seeing great growth on the, on the DG side, and we expect that to, to keep progressing into 2021. So I would say largely what you'll see is a heavy mix of DG uh, as we get in here for the next few quarters. But then we would expect by the time we get to the second half, you'll see more of the power plant markets start to, to come back for us. Okay, Joanne, we hand it off to you. Absolutely. Um, so for Q3 2020, our mix was uh, IBC was 67% and P-Series was 33%, and our expectation would be that it would be very similar for Q4. Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, and uh, you know, I guess I don't want to get too far ahead, but as we think about, you know, the mix impacts near term as you sort of throttle back performance due to uh, – some of the input cost increases you're seeing, you know, fair to assume that um, you know volume overall is going to be lighter in the first half than you you would have originally been thinking heading into 21. Or are you able to sh allocate enough over to you know IBC and the DG side um, to, to maybe make up for some of the the performance line um, you know throttling back? If I'm characterizing that correctly, yeah, I would I would really think about it in terms less about P-series versus IBC and more around DG, DG versus the, uh, the power plant side. And I would expect our Q1 and Q2 to be as expected, if anything, you know, ho hopefully a little bit better, but, uh, but certainly all indications are that DG will be strong, continually, continued strong into to 2021. On the power plant side, yeah, we would expect it to be less than what we were we may have been originally thinking, let's say back three months ago before we started to see the supply chain costs um, increase. That said, with the way things, uh, you know, we do expect the supply chain costs to be temporary in nature. And as those start to recover, which uh, we have full, full trust they will, we would expect that our Q3, Q4 business and power plant will pick back up again. Okay, great. And then maybe just... Um one, one last one, and I'll pass it on. With respect to the rising input costs, it seems like, you know, different players, uh, you know, some of your peers are, are seeing it in different periods given um, inventory management and just, you know, sort of how they're uh, exposed to to different, um, you know, different costs, whether poly or glass. Are you guys seeing that 
you know, more acutely in Q4, or would you say that um, you actually, you know, based on what you have already built up in inventory on raw materials, is that something we would see further pressure in Q1? You know, I would expect for now we're seeing it more acutely in Q4. I think Q1 still remains to be seen. Um, as, you know, there is a lot of movement going on within supply chain now, and certainly our teams are, are actively working uh, the situation. So I think we're, we're hopeful on Q1. We can only speak with clarity on Q4. Okay, great. Uh, that's super helpful. I'll pass it on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Our next question comes from Cheval Maltavan of Raymond James. Your line is open. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, you referenced the particular strength of, of Europe in the third quarter, and now, of course, Europe is the absolute epicenter of the COVID second wave, and, and we're seeing lockdowns hmm. for about 400 million people across the continent, uh, particularly for, uh, you know, for the rooftop business. What's been the, the impact, anything you've noticed, just in the last 30 days? You know, I would say as it relates to, to COVID in particular within Europe, you know, certainly Europe for us was the area that was hit first, if you go back to our, our calendar Q2 when we were still part of SunPower. And I think what's happened uh, with that experience is there's been a bit of a resilience that's been built up in terms of not only selling into the DG channels, but but also still doing installations, doing them safely. Uh, so being able to, to still drive those markets, despite the fact that there are, are sheltering in place going on in, to various degrees in the different marketplaces. So I think we're, we're hopeful, and I think we're expecting, and we're even seeing now that there is resilience when it comes to, you know, getting panels out into the marketplace and still driving that demand. You know, we are closely watching this across all the various markets that we serve. You know, we do sell into over 100 countries. We sell into, to obviously, the, the majority of them in Europe. Uh, we're seeing, I would say, some, obviously, some, some things that are going on around more restrictions for the broader public. But to date, we've really not seen any kind of a drop-off in terms of orders. Uh, so we'll keep monitoring it closely. But I would say today, things are still moving in a strong way for us in Europe. Good to hear. Um, turning to the U.S., you know, obviously we had the election two weeks ago, and, you know, who knows what will happen with the tax credit in the lame duck session or, or maybe the next Congress. But supposing that it's status quo and there is an expiration at the end of 21, how much of a um, demand pull-in uh, towards the end of 21, would you expect for your U.S. sales? You know, say right now we're, we're not seeing a dramatic pull-in for, for sales toward the end of the quarter. I won't give any specific numbers uh, since, as you know, we're fairly targeted in who we sell to uh, within the U.S. Side, side of our business. Uh, but I would say we're, we're still seeing uh, – we're still expecting some pull-in for safe harbor toward the end of the year. Um, but, but I would say something that's manageable for us. It's not a, I would say, a substantial uh, portion of our overall volume expected for, for 2021. Thank you. Lastly, can you just um, give us a, a, a total outstanding contract value for the above market component? I think it was $200 million a quarter ago, something like that. Why don't I hand that question off to Joanne? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the the net amount of the remaining contract total is 165 million dollars. That reflects the the remaining amount of the prepaid cash balance as well. Um, of that 165 million, um, you can think about 125 million of that is the out of market component, um, with the 40 million being the in market component. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Philip Philip Steen of Roth Capital. Your line is open. Hi everyone. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, you know, okay. uh, following up on one of the questions uh, Brian asked, uh, and I'll I guess approach this from a, from a different angle. But do you think and expect that your margin 
uh, performance for, for Q4 um, will likely be the trough margins uh, as it relates to the supply chain um, pricing challenges with glass. Meaning, you know, in other words, you expect a, a reasonable scenario where Q1 margins are better than Q4 uh, and Q2 better than Q1. And, and when do you expect to, you know, maybe get to uh, what you could consider normalized or, um, uh, yeah, normalized margins? So, uh, to the degree that you can comment on uh, the outlook and cadence of margins as we get through 21, I think that might be uh, quite helpful. Yeah, I'll give some first comments, and if Joanne has something to add, she can she can chime in. You know, I'd say as it relates to glass, and I would say the various supply chain challenges that are currently going on in China, I think our our belief is that here over the next likely few quarters, we will see those start to stabilize. There's certainly a lot of activity going on in the supply chain. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're expecting that, let's say, by the time we get to the end of Q2, you know, worst case, we'll see things, we'll see things settle. Um, so, you know, we are seeing a short-term impact here uh, in Q4 and, you know, potentially into Q1. A little too early to tell on how big of an impact it will have in, in 2021. Joanne, any, any additional color you'd like to add? Yeah, I think the only other color that I would add, Jeff, is, is, is that the, um, we're a very seasonal business from a manufacturing side, so their second half um, is stronger than the first half. Um, so our margins tend to be lower in the first half than the second half. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, as it relates to, uh, you know, when you talk about DG, clearly that there's a sub-segment um, or segmentation you can have uh, between resi and commercial. Uh, resi is, has been quite strong, I think, uh, both in Europe and here in the U.S., uh, but my, our sense is, you know, especially with uh, Solar Edge's recent report, that commercial um, business in Europe as well as the U.S. is not as strong. And, um, and the, the key driver, it appears, is um, like COVID. And, and are you seeing the same thing in your commercial DG business? And if not, why not? Or if so, you know, what do you? How much longer would you expect the weakness in that? Uh, sub sub segment uh, to continue. I would say so far we're we're not I would say seeing any specific weakness that's going on within commercial, and you know frankly it could be a matter of of the relationships that we have. Uh, we do track obviously to see if there is going to be any impact from a COVID perspective, uh, but for where we sit now, we're not seeing anything unexpected on the commercial side uh, versus what we were expecting going into the quarter. Great. Um, and then as it relates to your cost structure, uh, just um, our quick analysis here, um, after adjusting out the poly contract impact, uh, suggests I think Q3 blended cost per watt fell to call it 34 cents a watt uh, from about 39 cents in the prior quarter. Um, what was a, the key driver of that decline, and, and how do you expect that to continue um, into you know, next year? Okay. Joanne, would you like to uh, respond to that question? Um, yeah, I can, I can certainly get things going. So, so uh, uh, we certainly um, benefited from higher output being uh, the, the megawatts that we experienced in Q3, so we really got the benefit of the scale. That's what um, largely drove down the, um, the cost per watt, as well as just our ongoing um, uh, cost savings um, initiatives as well that continues to, to, to drive down costs. Um, uh, going forward, um, you know, as part of uh, our investments in modernizing our Malaysia factory, shifting the technology from MAX 2 to MAX 6, uh, we would expect to see improvements in uh, cost per watt. Um, and then because this is a blended corporate uh, rate, um, this does include uh, the performance series panels as well, um, and then we do have some of those headwinds that we're digesting in the near term relating to the higher costs. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, maybe I'll ask one more and I'll pass it on. Uh, this is more of a housekeeping question, but uh, how much of your 2021 CapEx is for P-series?
Joanne, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so uh, we have a, a very wide range on, on our capex uh, right now. Um, so uh, seventy five million to one fifty. Uh, the vast majority of our capex is in support of uh, IBC, uh, specifically the Max Six investments, um, and then followed by investments in uh, in Max Seven and bringing up the Singapore Labs. Um, any investments we make into P-Series would be uh, through our joint venture partner, HSPV. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that would be reflected, I would, I would suggest, in the, within the high end of the range. Yeah, and I, and I would, again, I would, I would point out that that is, it's not really so much a CapEx investment as it is an equity investment. And that's something where we just have an ongoing dialogue with, uh, with HSPV and with, uh, with TZS in terms of those investments. Okay. Uh, thank you both. I'll pass it on. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Taylor Malkovich of Raymond James. Line is open. Yeah. Thanks for uh, for letting me in again. Uh, d just to clarify, the sales in China for the first half of 21 that you've you've allocated those volumes. Where is that going to show up on the income statement? Yeah, thanks for the question, Pavel. So the sales in China from the joint venture show up as revenue for the joint venture. So for Maxion, all, all of our sales are for outside of China. And then, and then from and then a, where that shows up, up. yeah, join. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Uh, we would pick up our 20% ownership share as, as a, an equity pickup, uh, so of their profits, not of their revenues. Right, so that's in uh, non-controlling interest. Yep. Um, it is uh, uh, non-controlling interest. Um, yeah, it's in other income and expense. Got it. Okay. And operating uh, expense uh, 421, I mean, obviously you're, you're not explicitly guiding to 21 today, but recalling some numbers you gave from, from the original analyst meeting, you know, how should we think about that? Presumably the Q4 number of 32 million, you said there is some one-time non-recurring cost in that, correct? Yeah, Joanne, why don't you take that? Yeah, it's so uh, uh, first let me let me clean up my prior answer to you, Pavel. Um, so specifically, the line item in the income statement is the equity and losses of unconsolidated investees is where we would be picking up the um, our share of HSPD's profits. Um, on your on your question on opex, uh, uh, as you said, our Q4 opex is uh, we we had indicated that it would be around thirty three million dollars, which includes some incremental one time costs. Um, we are shifting our, our overhead function from the U.S. and becoming more Asian-centric. Um, and so we do expect to get savings as we do that, um, as we bring up headcount in Singapore, Philippines, and Malaysia, and we look to eliminate headcounts as we make the shift. Um, and uh, while not guiding 2021, um, I would say that OPEX would stay around this level uh, directionally. Um, as we uh, look to take advantage of the opportunities we see in the DG channels and to leverage our technology and brand advantages, um, we expect to have some incremental headcounts in sales and R&D and expand our, our marketing efforts, we'll, which will we'll then offset some of those incremental costs. Yeah, and I would just add to that that there's also, uh, in addition to the DG investment, there, we're also expecting some additions on the power plant side as we begin to increasingly scale up that organization to be able to handle uh, demand creation. Got it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one on your touchstone telephone. Our next question comes from John Segwitz of Luminous. Your line is open. Hi guys, I just wanted to come back a little bit to the China change um, with your joint venture. So just to clarify, we're really just talking about the performance series part of the large scale PowerPoint division, which was about 20 million of revenue in the last quarter. Is that really what's being affected next year? That's correct. 
Okay, so the performance series going into DG should continue to be there. It's just that other piece is going to get diverted. Yeah, exactly. And the the performance series is, as you know, it's the kind of the better best situation we have with the IBC selling in at, at higher premiums with higher performance, and we have the performance series which competes with the the more commodity solar that's out there. That side of the business is continuing uh, robustly, and and uh, we'll expect it to do that. Really what we're talking about, as you said, is the power plant side. Okay. And, and again, you've now brought up another line of IBC Max 5. Just remind us, Max 5, I guess, is the highest margin product that you have in the business? It is. And actually, there's an additional nuance to it. So Max 5 is the product that we ramped uh, over the course of last year, and that's running at about 240 megawatts a year today. We are bringing up a line of Max 6, which is a slightly larger wafer format, which brings uh, some cost benefits, brings some, some uh, additional uh, efficiency benefits as well. So Max 6 is what we're ramping. That will be essentially uh, fully ramped in Q4. And then what we'll then begin to do over a period of time is convert that Max 5 line to Max 6. It's much more of a, a minor adjustment. It's not... Uh, kind of a, more of a whole-scale replacement like we had with, with Max 2 to Max 5. So you'll see a little bit of a tweak on Max 5 converting into Max 6. Okay, and that's this fourth quarter, right? Uh, 2021 is the, 2021. when okay. Ma the, the new line of Max 6 will come online. Perfect. Okay, thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star than 1. One moment, please. I'm showing no further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to Jeff Waters for any closing remarks. Great, thank you. So I'll make some closing remarks, and I'll have Gary review some upcoming investor events. Uh, so we are very excited to be an independent company. Uh, we believe there are significant growth opportunities in our DG business around the world. And we intend to build our distribution channels and product offering to fully capture that great opportunity. Uh, to fulfill the growing demand we anticipate, we've already embarked on refreshing our IBC manufacturing base, uh, which will upgrade our entire IBC manufacturing fleet to the highest levels of industry performance, leadership, and premium value. Uh, with respect to the large market, as we've been discussing, large-scale market, we are convinced that market growth combined with our differentiated technology uh, will create profitable opportunities in the years ahead. And now, before we close, uh, Gary will note an upcoming investor event for Maxion. Gary? Thanks, Jeff. Maxion will present and host one-on-one -on -one meetings at the Bank of America Renewables Symposium on December 3rd. The symposium will be held virtually. It's a private event, so please contact your B of A representative to register. Thank you all again. This concludes the call, and you may now disconnect.